Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Muskegon City Commission meeting for January 9th, 2018. Before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to invite up Reverend Robert Henderson of First Wesleyan Church to lead us in prayer. Anyone that would like to, we'd like to invite you to join us. And following the prayer, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Reverend, please. Thank you. Let us pray together. Our Creator and Redeemer, we thank you so much for the provisions, gifts, and resources that you provide for each of us according to our needs. Thank you, God, for our servant leaders of this city commission. Thank you for the city workers and pray for their safety and well-being as they serve our community. Thank you also for our law enforcement and ask that you would enable them by your spirit as they help keep the peace as well as investigate, that you would provide the answers and enable them in their work. Be with our first responders, our fire department, as well as ambulatory services. And I pray that you would give the city of Muskegon the peace and prosperity that we need in order to build up the lives of its citizens. I pray for those who feel as though they have no voice, for those who feel as though they have nothing, those who are dealing with abuse and living in abusive situations, as well as those who are abusers, and pray that there would be a peace that would come from you and that you would help us who are in positions of authority and leadership and as neighbors and friends that we would do our part in seeing that everyone has the opportunity to prosper and live in peace. Help us to seek your plans, plans that you have of hope and a future for us. And for those of us who claim to be Christians, I pray that as we claim to love you with all of our being, that we would just as well love our neighbors as ourselves and that we would treat each person, regardless of whom they are or what they believe, we would treat them with dignity and respect. Help us to respect all people. Help us to honor you, Creator God. Thank you for this opportunity you give us as citizens in this great nation to come together, to live in a democracy, and to express it in, as such as this. Again, be with this meeting tonight, be with the leaders here, be with the citizens, and may Christ be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend. May we have the roll call, please? Mayor Garvin. Here. Vice Mayor Hood. Here. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear me. Yeah. Here. <laughs> the other one. Here. Commissioner Turnquist. Here. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Here. Trouble today. Here. Commissioner Warren. <laughs> here. Are we done? Present. Everybody here? Ah, dig it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get into the uh, meat and potatoes of the uh, meeting, we have uh, some uh, recognitions, rather joyful recognitions, uh, to make this evening. So I'm going up here. Shane, want to come up? What would be the easiest way? Have uh, our men line up here? Gentlemen, you're doing a favor and line up here and face the audience and big reds. That's right. That's particularly red you're wearing this evening. It's <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Can't see now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
the big rats brought it home this year. Whereas it gives me a great deal of pleasure to express to all the members of the Muskegon High School Big Reds football team our sincere admiration for an exciting, hard-fought, successful season. And whereas, under the guidance of Coach Shane Fairfield, you guys know him? Okay. <laughs> we congratulate the Muskegon High School Big Reds football team on their 2017 Division III state championship and whereas this fine team of young men demonstrated an outstanding spirit of dedication, enthusiasm, and hard work, now therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor Garland, speaking on behalf of the City Commission and the entire community, deem it an honor and <coughs> pleasure to present this certificate of recognition to the Big Reds football team for a remarkable year in football, and I had an uncle that was on the third team, 1933. We got pictures of that, so <laughs> <laughs> I've got some time. <laughs> Gentlemen, something to hang in the kitchen or the restroom or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> we'll be hanging one up on the streets, okay? So as you go driving by, you go, oh yeah. <laughs> Good job. Good job, Shane. <coughs> Do we have Mr. Ladarius Jefferson in the house? <laughs> I knew that because I saw you come in. <laughs> Jefferson, come on up. I like his sweats. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me a great deal of pleasure to express to Ladarius Jefferson our sincere admiration and congratulations for his outstanding achievement and being named High School Football Player of the Year. And whereas Ladarius Jefferson scored 54 touchdowns, top 2,000 yards rushing, and 1,000 yards passing in his senior season, and is signed on with Michigan State University, <laughs> now therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor Garland, speaking on behalf of the City Commission and the entire community, deem it an honor and a pleasure to present this certificate of recognition to Ladarius Jefferson in recognition of his outstanding achievements and commend him on his display of sportsmanship and leadership. And we'll be watching you on TV in the <laughs> Well, that was really great. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like hanging out and congratulating <coughs> your own kids, because you are. 
you're ours. And we love you. We're proud of you. Keep going forward. Call on us when needed, okay? And a phone call away. So here for you all. Bless you. And great luck in all things, all right? <coughs> Commissioner German, we have a yeah. guest this evening. Uh, uh, yes, we do. Okay, let me get the podium here. He's behind you guys. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year's. I'd like to welcome you all to our first 2018 commission meeting. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of Introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Augustine V. Arbalou, who brings more than 16 years of senior management experience in his position as Executive Director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, MDCR. Before jo joining MDCR, Arbalou served as President CEO of a post-acute care organization aimed at reducing rehospitalization and maximizing patient satisfaction. <clears throat> His prior work experience also includes holding senior management leadership positions in manufacturing, healthcare, and nonprofit sectors. And 15 years as a practicing attorney specializing in corporate, business, and tax law. Arbalu has taught graduate level courses on organizational leadership, change management, finance, and strategies. For more than 30 years, Arbalu has been involved in a variety of civil community organizations. He was president and founder of the Hispanic Bar of Michigan and the Hispanic Business Alliance, and has served on numbers, a number of boards, including the Boys and Girls Club of Southeast Michigan, Leadership Detroit, Detroit, and Lyric Chamber Ensemble. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the St. Joseph Oakland Hospital, which is part of Trinity Health System. Abelou serves as chair of the Michigan Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commissions on Civil Rights. Arbalu earned his executive doctorate degree in management from Case Western Reserve University Weatherhead School of Management. He also holds two masters, the first from the Thunderbird School of Global Management and the second from Lawrence Technological University, as well as a Juris Doctorate from the University of Detroit School of Law and a LLM in taxation from New York University of Law. Arbalu was appointed to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission by Governor Rick Snyder in January of 2013 and held that office as secretary until he left the commission on October 2015. I'd like you to give Dr. Arbalu a warm welcome as he comes and presents his presentation. Thank you, Commissioner German, and thank you to all the distinguished members of the City Council and the Mayor for allowing me to come before you to present some important work that we, the Michigan Civil Rights Commission and the Department of Civil Rights has been undertaking during the past 24 months that we believe offers local jurisdictions like Muskegon the opportunity to reduce as well as eliminate racial discrimination. <clears throat> I want to take some time here to talk our, about our work centered on racial inequities that exist really across every indicator for success, such as health, education, employment, housing, criminal justice, and beyond. 
You know, our democracy is built on the notions of trust in our government, hope and opportunity. We believe the greatest threat to our democracy is when our residents have a sense of hopelessness and loss of trust. And that is why we recognize that government has a key role in advancing the pillars that our democracy were built on, notions of trust, hope, and opportunity. If you could, please. And it's because of the work that we did in Flint during 2016 to determine whether the civil rights of Flint residents were abridged or violated by the actions leading up to the Flint water crisis, where we began to realize that a shift in focus is necessary. We heard from well over 160 plus residents, experts, scholars. Repeatedly, we heard the loss of trust in government at all levels and a sense of hopelessness. If you could, please. <clears throat> the commission learned how our systems and structures at all levels, directly and indirectly, produce and reproduce segregation of opportunities and wealth based on race, class, and identity. These current structures and systems are sustained through the present by historical legacies of slavery, Jim Crow, and currently spatial racism that repeat patterns of exclusion, baked so deeply that it is virtually invisible to those privileged. There's a saying that privilege is invisible to those who possess it. The commission found that while not intentionally deep, divides along racial and class lines exist and continue, even with the implementation of facially neutral policies, laws, practices, and processes. And that is why I'm here. If you could, please. Two key recommendations were developed and introduced by the commission recognizing that gaps continue among and between groups of people for which we believe communities need to implement. One, building and advancing a racial equity framework that incorporates the science of implicit bias and impact. And two, the importance of exploring and recommending ways to change the dominant stories or narratives that we hear and read based on a system of racial hierarchy by having communities develop more complete narratives that challenge racial hierarchies and discrimination by launching trust, racial healing, and transformation processes that invites all segments of a community to fully participate all in an effort to advance a vision of truly creating a Michigan where all residents have equitable opportunities to grow and thrive. If you could, please. So today, I will quickly go through a number of pillars built from these recommendations that we believe are crucial to redesigning our system to better build a community that is more inclusive. These include equity, implicit bias, structural and systemic racism, the importance of impact, and the opportunities that exist with launching a community-based TRHT process. The 1960s were periods of upheaval, but it also was the birth of the civil rights movement. Diversity and inclusion had become and still are popular words, but over time, we have recognized that it has failed to address gaps that continue whether in education, employment, housing, health, and quality of life. Diversity is about bringing variety into the room, but not addressing what to do once in the room. After the civil rights era, diversity has become the buzzword. The bus so now what? Diversity without the opportunity to have a voice in the workplace remains really in reality a segregated workplace. We need to move away from 
talking about diversity and inclusion and began to embed equity, targeting those marginalized and left out on the margins. If you may, please. <clears throat> Bill, bringing up race, I know, is a difficult topic. Too often I hear that it's divisive. But I say to you as the director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, we must not be afraid to confront it and address it. What really is divisive is leaving one third of a people out of the opportunity to fully participate in the greatness our country can offer. Do people have differential needs? We must recognize that racial justice is about fairness and not sameness. Equity is the only way we can get there. The fact is that we are all not starting from the same place, and that is the challenge we face. That is why we should focus on equity. It is not only the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do. If I may, if you could please. Equality also creates challenges since it means the same treatment under the law or being colorblind and not seeing one's race. This only creates, I believe, more inequity. To get people out of inequity, we need to do more. We need to be striving to achieve goals for all without reducing our standards of excellence. Consider a building with stairs, but an individual with disabilities in a wheelchair does not give that person access. This is not fair and equitable treatment. The problem is that people of color have had the ground where they stand dug out through baked in structures, systems, practices, policies that have left segments, these segments of our community marginalized so that the ground is not even even to begin with. It is like running a mile on a track and instead of running four laps, you're running five laps because you're one lap behind to start with. Racial equity is the systemic fair treatment of all races that produces equitable opportunity and outcomes for all people. It is systemic and it is about outcomes. Equity means we solve problems for everybody and not just for those most closely positioned to take advantage. One of the most difficult topics that exists is about, as I've said, race. We must talk about color or race because we see it in a number of measurement and indicators like housing, criminal justice, employment, education, and health, where gaps continue to the present. To bring about change requires our intentionality, not just because it's the right thing, as I said, but it is always the smart thing. We need to consider in the context of our social political structure that exists, what is in our community. What I mean is by this, that these arrangements do not develop in a vacuum. In the case of our history, they are constructs that developed from slavery and the genocide of Native Americans and Jim Crow, where separate but legal doctrines prevailed until the mid 20th century. But change in law does not necessarily mean change in structure, systems, and inter institutional arrangements. Through inter-institutional arrangements and dynamics that create and reproduce disparities in the applications of policies, practices, policy, we begin to see what takes place. Just think about our pockets here. In Flint, we recognized that, and we saw, as we have seen across Michigan, the disparity that existed between Flint, Genesee County, and Michigan. And then we began to look in other communities. And we began to see disparities. And we began to look out and reflect on certain measurements. For example, it's like disparate outcomes and educational attainment. If you could just move right there. Graduation level from high school show that as a percentage blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans lag behind. And when it comes to earning a bachelor's degree, 
black, Latinos, and Native Americans also lag behind other communities. So the issue is not that our schools are failing, it is that segments within our communities lag behind. And targeting efforts to address these inequities is really how we can go about and seeing progress, if you could. And then let's look at poverty. Poverty shows that while blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans make up less than 25% of the U.S. population, they represent 75% who live in poverty, if you could. And then let us look at our justice systems, where blacks are incarcerated over three times the percentage of the U.S. population, while wh whites make up 80% of the U.S. population but represent only 34% who are incarcerated. In fact, one in three black male stands a chance of being incarcerated. We must do better, we can do better. But to do better, we need to do it with intention and focus, if you could please. You know, most people, if you were to ask, do you view yourself as biased? Do you view yourself as racist? racist? 85% of people would say no. This is not to say that explicit bias does not continue to plague society. But studies reveal that the role of intent is less present. Too often nowadays, we've been taught to be colorblind, but, and yet we continue to produce disparate outcomes. Without intentional intervention, inequitable, outcomes linked to race, social, economic status, and other identities will persist. And that is why I want to talk to you about implicit bias. We are the product of policies that have perpetuated systems and structures that have had unintended consequences. What is implicit bias? Well, implicit bias, in a short hand way is to say that it's a preference for a group or a prejudice against a group, positive or negative, often operating outside our own awareness, subconscious, based on stereotypes and attitudes we hold. If you could please. In fact, consciously, we're only aware of about 2%. So unconsciously, we are able to produce immense amount of ways that control how we will act. The characteristics of implicit bias can really be broken down into three parts. It operates at the subconscious level, and it is normal. We all have that subconscious component. It runs contrary, though, number two, to our conscious beliefs. This means we truly believe that we have noble goals, but yet we see housing patterns, we see in law enforcement, actions that belie where our conscious beliefs are. And third, and this is important, they are triggered by rapid automatic mental associations that shape behavior. The worst part about implicit bias is that it carries over to our structural and institutional practices and policies that produce this and reproduce these disparate outcomes, like our housing patterns. In 1978, the average black household earned 59 cents for every dollar of income whites earned. That's close to 50 years ago. In 2016, black families still earn 59 cents for every dollar of income that white families received. Our current system is systematically excluding people of color. As Thomas Jefferson stated, there's nothing more unfair than the equal treatment of unequal people. If you could, please. So what can we do? And let me give you another example by David R. Williams. You could please. He's a well-known sociologist from Harvard who earned his degree from University of Michigan, has written extensively around health disparities, racism, and implicit bias. And he talks about how association of certain words unconsciously reveal hidden biases. So he did a study. When it comes to the word black, 
what comes up in American culture, what co-occurs with it? Poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. And yet when we think of the word white, what comes up? Wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. And yet the science of implicit bias would say that if whites were asked to consciously associate a black person with the words set forth on this slide, whites would reject them. That is, our conscious belief do not align with our subconscious mind. So implicit bias has built in these rapid mental associations that shapes our behavior every day. But why should we focus on implicit bias from a policy perspective? And why I'm here? I offer you three reasons. One, focus on implicit bias offers us a more expansive diagnosis to tackling racism and social political construct that we live in. And yet a majority of the tools to address bias are explicit based based to tackling discrimination, which are odds with the implicit bias approach. So what we have in this country is a mismatch, a disconnect to diagnosing the challenging surrounding racial differences. An implicit bias approach allows us to take a more expansive approach compared to how we have tackled the issues surrounding race. Two, it is predictive and preventive. One, to predict not only our behavior, but also prevent us from adopting policies and practices, as well as allowing us revisiting our structures and processes that lead to disparate outcome. We have the opportunity, by understanding the implicit bias, to redesign, redesign our structures, our policies, and our practices, so that we keep this in mind, and so that we avoid the repeat of what is occurring to the present. And third, it offers really a win-win approach. What do I mean by this? The implicit bias approach reduces or eliminates the focus on shaming or guilt, which is too often intentionally or unintentionally done. You know, human beings will not feel the motivation, I believe, to make the self-change work that is needed if all they feel is shame and guilt, or it is fatalistic. There will be a sense this is how things are. Nothing can be done. This is a wrong approach. The implicit bias approach makes the central, the central question not are you racist, but ask how do we make our actions and behavior align to push forth a racial equity approach. So all, regardless of color or race, can have the opportunity to grow and thrive. So in order to solve the problems, I, I have offered you some structural approaches to reprime the brain, but more importantly, structurally, removing impediments to act on that bias, like ban the box for persons with a criminal record, or intentionally designing and adopting rules and procedures with equity in mind, change the interview process for hiring or retraining brokers, agents, or, or HR here in how we handle the hiring of people. That's why I'm here. The role of government is critically important. The Department of Civil Rights recognized that local jurisdictions can play an important role in attacking the structures and systems that lead and maintain these disparate outcomes. As, as a result, we are investing resources to educate local jurisdictions like Muskegon and others on the importance of advancing racial equity within their structures and in the work they do with those marginalized. To advance equity, government must focus on policy and institutional strategies that are driving the production of inequities. We are also working at the national level with GARE the Government National Alliance on Race and Equity. GEAR is a national network of government, local gov jurisdictions, county and state that have created a network of over 60 members across 40 states providing tools 
to put in theory into action. In Michigan, governmental jurisdictions are making a commitment to advancing and achieving racial equity, focusing on the power and influence of their own institutions and working in partnerships with others. We see that taking place in Ottawa County, City of Grand Rapids, Washtenaw County, City of Ann Arbor. In addition, we are talking to a number of other cities across Michigan who recognize that taking a racial and adopting a racial equity framework makes sense so they can bring about significant change. So we made a commitment here at MDCR to intentionally focus on educating you, the leaders, the representatives of this great community on the incredible possibilities that exist for government to advance racial equity. We are working to build our capacity and commitment by having an equity officer in place. And I'm happy to be here tonight with you because our racial equity officers here with us. Alfredo Hernandez over here, who's a resident of Muskegon, who will be joining our department very shortly to take the lead on this important initiative. We're also working and developing a toolkit where we will be sharing with you to be able to help advance this particular framework. We're working with state agencies like the Michigan Department of Education, Department of Human and Health Services, to identify programs or other initiatives to implement. We know it's going to take time. We know that it's going to be hard work. But we also believe that racial equity is the approach. We're also embedding our racial equity with our ALPAC chapters, the advocates and trust and advocates and leaders for police and community trust that exist in well over 10 communities in Michigan. We believe it's critically important. And we also are working with four communities in Michigan around trust, racial healing, and transformation. The TRHT initiative is an important work that, was, that has been led by local community foundations. It is the beginning and I trust will play an important role. As I begin to conclude my comments, I do want to talk briefly about TRHT. This is a community-based process, and I would hope that you, the leaders of this great community, will take it on. It is, was launched uh, approximately one year ago by the Kellogg Foundation to create transformational and sustainable change and address the history and contemporary effects of racism, racism by jettisoning unconscious belief created by racism. In Michigan, as I said, there are four TRHT sites, Battle Creek, Flint, Kalamazoo, and Lansing. Complements the work of local jurisdictions around racial equity working with local communities, foundations, and community-based organizations are heavily involved in designing a TRH process that is all-inclusive. It means it brings into this process everyone in the community. It is a shift in mindset, a transformational process. It is not an initiative nor grant-making initiative. It serves to shift from a hierarchy of human values and serves to eliminate what has been the historical belief systems surrounding racism. We need to create a different story, a different narrative. I really encourage you. We understand that Kellogg is looking to expand the TRHT to add a couple more TRH sites in Michigan. And I would strongly encourage Muskegon to take the lead to get one of those additional sites. Final thought. We recognize that this work is slow, frustrating, and it takes time. But we encourage this body to take up the call and adopt a racial equity framework. Embrace it. Work with us to make equity a key and driving force of your strategy as you move forward to make your community more equitable. And I end with a brief quote from the late Robert Kennedy. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, 
or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I believe, and I am optimistic today, that across all Michigan, small and big communities are seeing ripples of hope and redesigning their communities, as well as having each one of us doing our part in bringing forth a ripple of hope. We look forward to working with Muskegon and all segments of your community and joining in this struggle to better align government and community so that as the late Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions or comments for uh, Dr. Arbulu? Well, this is the second time you and uh, I have met. Yes. You know, um, and as we fully assume this into uh, our, our psyches, um, I look forward to continued uh, dialogue and working with you. Well, we look forward to working with each and every one of you. We think that the work that we are undertaking here and that the opportunities that, ex that <coughs> present itself to a community like Muskegon are incredible. And I would hope that at the very minimum, you truly look at the truth racial healing transformation process. When I learned that there would be two additional sites potentially in sight, I immediately thought of your community. I thought that what a great opportunity to re, um, redesign the narrative, to think about a bottom-up process that could bring segments of community together in a process that moves uh, moves forward in a way that brings about significant change. I think there was a hand up here. Commissioner Warren? Yes, thank you. Um, can you expand a little bit on the TRHT process? Yes. On how a community would become? First, I, I will, I will. It was, um, I think w one of the things that needs to be done is to make contact with a Kellogg to indicate your interest, the Kellogg Foundation, um, and we can get you that information, the president, to express your interest in this process, but also engage your community-based organizations to also show support for this process. There is website, on the website of Kel Kellogg, there's an implementation book that you can download that will tell you a lot, provide a lot of information, Commissioner, on this process. But I think what is key and what I've learned is those who speak the loudest get heard. And this is something where if you can um, publicize it, talk to community-based organizations across the board, it's not just the United Way. I'm talking about those those that are marginal who can come on board and see the value because with it, not only comes dollars, but they comes funds to continue that initiative beyond the four or five years. I hope I've been helpful in that regard. That's great. <coughs> Mr. Johnson? That was actually the exact question I had. Uh, <laughs> but I would say thank you for coming out tonight. You're uh, welcome. And sharing uh, your research findings and suggestions and insights. Also, congratulations to you and Mr. Hernandez Corsan. Um, congratulations to you for um, Having him come on your staff, um, he's an excellent person. We're very excited to have him. With a wealth of knowledge. Um, and we're excited that he's going to be joining our Equal Opportunity com uh, Committee. Good. Uh, so that may be something that uh, the EOC can work on looking at having our city join the Government Alliance on Race and Equity um, and moving forward with that in tandem with our application to Kellogg Foundation um, on becoming a TRHT site. Uh, so, uh, and. I look forward to helping out um, in any capacity I can. If the EOC is going to take the lead on that, I'd be happy to help support that and coordinate with the community foundation, our community foundation here, 
or any other um, public institutions to get them on board uh, so that we can have a very strong case for why we should be our uh, TRHT site here. If I, if I may, Commissioner, I, I also want to introduce our community liaison, Gwen Moffitt over here. Uh, she does, she's headquartered in Grand Rapids and whatever uh, resources or support is needed, uh, I, sh I know she's available and she will communicate with our senior leadership. I'm fortunate also tonight to have my deputy director, uh, Carol Venti, over here uh, with us. So you've got uh, a lot of the uh, who's who from MDCR present. So we're very excited to have had this opportunity. So thank you again. I, I, but I'm very gratified to hear is that you're bringing this um, level of resource and you know presence. <laughs> You know, through the decades, you know, people and the community here in Muskegon, you know, have taken some very commendable, um, you know, steps and created initiatives. But I think with the uh, additional focus and your additional presence and additional resource of that presence, uh, we can reinvigorate and continue to grow and improve uh, many, many great things. Uh, that individuals and organizations um, are in the process or have been in the process of, you know, uh, working through uh, for, 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 many, for many years for the sake of all our people. So uh, this is uh, very exciting to have you here this evening. Thank you. Right. Commissioner Warren. Um, another exciting opportunity that you brought up was that a community resource toolkit is being developed yes is that best to watch the website in the upcoming months well i think it's going to be about two more months we have we were very fortunate and i'll give you a little bit of background we had university of michigan uh, uh the ford school of public policy uh do a, a an initial draft we are now beginning to re uh, redesign it to more in keeping to what we're looking to do, and we're expecting to have that available in the next two to three months. And we will share that with the city and community-based organizations with helpful hints on how you can make use of it. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. You're good. Commissioner German? Yeah, Dr. Alvalu, can you talk a little bit about the um, ALPAC? Also. Yes, the we have. I know that you have a. I believe a social justice mm -hmm. commission here. Yes. In Muskegon, our alpacs are uh, set up in about ten different jurisdictions across Michigan. What is? It was designed to really bring together law enforcement and community-based organizations, leaders of community-based organizations together to meet on a monthly basis outside the glare of social media, to meet and eyeball each other so they could find ways to reduce crisis that often have come about, and we've seen that in other communities. We have been successful to some degree, not totally, and this effort, what is unique about it is that each component, the community-based, and the law enforcement are equal partners in this endeavor. So we have two co-chairs who set the agenda and bring together this broad range of, of uh, representative of law enforcement agencies and representatives from community-based organizations to get together, which in many cases would not have that opportunity uh, to, to do. So it has proven to be successful, like I said, in a number of our communities. If, if Muskegon should decide and, and, uh, to look in this further, we'd be more than happy to chat with you. We don't force it. It is something that is community driven. It is something that your region would want to do. But we have found it to be very useful and uh, we'd be more than happy to share whatever information we have on our alpacs with you. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yes, um, I don't know if you or Gwen maybe um, can answer this. The difference between our social justice and the ALPAC is, could you maybe explain? Well, do you have co two co-chairs or no, do you have one? Don't. And that's the other thing. We do have, 
two cultures equal who really drive the agenda. And so they come into this gathering as co-equals and talk about, for example, the focus might be on implicit bias training. The focus might be on, on an event or that could be um, a threat to the community. And you have, outside the glare of social media, these honest discussion because, as you know, over time, the more interaction you have with someone you have not had in the past, you de begin to develop trust. Mm -hmm. And you begin to have that openness to be able to talk about serious issues. That's how really our alpacs. We don't meet necessarily in uh, during the summer. Alpacs are also very unique. That every community is distinct, and some of our more western uh, located alpacs, the Latino community, the migrant uh, workforce becomes a player. I'll give you an example, uh, and go back to Flint. There was a lot of talk. Uh, back in uh, 2016 uh, regarding ICE and the activities relating to the undocumented during the Flint water crisis so that the undocumented that made up about 3-4% of the Flint population would not go to get bottled water. So we were able to put together a uh, all these different segments, the federal, the state, uh, the county, the city, and community-based organizations to come together to talk about what really was taking place, what what kinds of gossips existed that they could dispel. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Glenn, great to see you. Thank you. Congratulations, all. And uh, we look forward to uh, continued outreach and uh, working with you in great endeavors. And that and safe travels. Thank you. I think we have another introduction this evening. Angie, may you? Angie, come on up. Introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Hi, I came tonight to introduce myself. I am um, in the newly hired executive director of the Muskegon Housing Commission. Um, I come to you with um, a wealth of experience, I would say. Um, I've been working with basically the homeless population in housing for the last over 23 years. Um, I've worked, um, I'm really happy to be able to work in the actual community that I've lived that I've never done before. Um, I've always worked outside of my community. Um, but I've done homeless prevention and um, in Nuego County, um, the Housing Commission in Grand Rapids, and most recently I ran a homeless shelter in East Lansing for the last 12 years. Um, so I'm very excited to, one, begin working with you. Hello, Willie. Yeah, hey, how you doing? Um, and um, create a relationship between us and um, with you appointing our commissioners, I would like to be more involved and get to know you all better and what the Housing Commission's goals are in the, in the future. So just wanted to introduce myself, say I'm here and I'm open um, if anybody wants to come over and visit us. Very good. All right. Well, congratulations and welcome home. Thank you. You're welcome. May we have the consent agenda, please? Uh, item A, approval of minutes, city clerk. Summer of request to approve the minutes of the December 11, 2017 work session and the December 12, 2017 regular meeting. Staff recommendation, approval of the minutes. Item B, bicycle ordinance, second reading, city manager. Summer of request to adopt the proposed ordinance containing rules to govern a driver of a motor vehicle overtaking a bicycle proceeding in the same direction. Staff recommendation to adopt the ordinance as presented. Item C, Amendment to the Zoning Ordinance, Critical Dune, Second Reading, Planning and Economic Development. Summer of Request. Staff has initiated request to amend Section 2310 of the Zoning Ordinance to adopt a local Critical Dune Ordinance, Act 451 of 1994. The Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act allows municipalities to enact their own Critical Dune Ordinance and enforce it themselves rather than relying on the Michigan Department of Environmental, Environmental Quality to do so. Staff anticipates that this will speed up the approval process for projects located in critical dune areas. Staff recommendation to approve the zoning ordinance amendment. Committee recommendation, the Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of the ordinance amendment at their November 16 meeting. 
Item D, adopt a resolution approving the liquor license application for E1635 LLC for a Class C liquor license at 1635 Bidler, City Clerk. Summary of request to adopt a resolution approving a Class C liquor license for E1635 LLC at 1635 Bidler. Staff recommendation, adopt a resolution approving the request for a Class C liquor license for E1635 LLC at 1635 Bidler. Item E, approval of Neighborhood Enterprise Zone Certificate for 1173 4th Street from Planning and Econ Economic Development. Summary of request, an application for a Neighborhood Enterprise Zone Certificate has been received from the Community and Compass Rehabilitation of a Home at 1173 4th Street. The rehab will include upgrades to the roof, bathroom, paint, flooring, and windows and will cost about $25,000. Community and Compass will hold the NEZ certificate in abeyance until it's transferred to a new owner within two years. The applicant has met local and state requirements for the issuance of the NEZ certificate. Staff recommendation, approval of the NEZ certificate. Item F, Ryerson Creek, cleanup efforts and resolution and support. Department of Public Works, summary request. The West Michigan Shoreline Regional Development Commission and ATY Metals are seeking funding from the Environmental Protection Agency and Michigan Department of Environmental Quality to continue cleanup efforts related to the contaminated soils and watersheds affecting the Great Lakes with the eventual goal of delisting Muskegon Lake. Wimser Dick is gathering support and contributions as matched for federal funding. In an effort to provide in-kind contributions, staff have reviewed sanitary sewer capacity and recommend allowing up to 100,000 gallons of wastewater into our system at no cost to the project. Lost revenue associated with this request amounts to approximately $200. The project will not restrict future development or dredging. Staff is requesting that a resolution of support for the project be approved. Staff recommendation, approve resolution of support for the Ryerson Creek Great Lakes Legacy at Contaminated Sediment Cleanup Project. Item G, City Hall East Entrance Roof Replacement, Department of Public Works. Summary of request. The roof over the east entrance of City Hall needs to be replaced due to age and improper drainage. Last spring, the project was advertised and bids were taken with the low bid amount being $42,000. In order to capitalize on that bid amount, commitment for the work had to be given and materials ordered prior to the end of the calendar year. If delayed, the increased cost of materials and labor would be $4,200. The finance director confirmed that there is available funding for the work and the city manager gave approval to move forward with the bid and seek commission approval at the January 9 meeting since there was no meeting planned for the fourth Tuesday in December. Staff is requesting that the budget increase be approved to fund the replacement on the roof. <coughs> Staff recommendation, approved budget increase for the roof replacement for the east entrance to City Hall. Item H, Community Relations Committee resignations and removals, City Clerk. Summary request to accept the following resignations and removals. Board of Review, Resignation of Sandra Boone Thomas, Election Commission, Resignation of Lewis Spike, Equal Opportunity Committee, Removal of Stephen Santo for Lack of Attendance, Housing Commission, Resignation of Jerry Lottie, Income Tax Board of Review, Removal of Jason Mikoff, Move from Jurisdiction, Local Development Finance Authority, Removal of Jason Mikoff, Move from Jurisdiction, Staff Recommendation to Approve the Resignations and Removals. Item I, Community Relations Committee Appointment Recommendations, City Clerk. Summer of Request, to accept reappointments and appointments for various Community Relations Committees, Boards, Authorities, and Commissions as follows. <sighs> Board of Review, reappoint Mary Jameson, <laughs> Don Carell, Clinton Todd, and Steve Warmington as an alternate. Appoint Jane Klingman Scott and Martha Bottomley as an alternate. Citizen Police Review Board, reappoint David Bucala and Ruby Clark. CDBG slash CDC reappoint Kim Burr and Jeremy Leonards. Appoint Carrie Johnson, Scott Banninga, and Poppy C.S. Hernandez. Construction Board of Appeals. Reappoint Chad Grunwis, James Fox, Harold Callender, and Michael McFall. I think that's supposed to be McPhail. Anyway, Downtown Development Authority reappoint Heidi Seitzma, Jeanette Moore and John Riegler. Election Commission, appoint Betty Roberts and Casey Allard. Equal Opportunity Committee, reappoint Rosie Buchanan and Diane Murray McKinley. Appoint Alfredo Hernandez Corson. Historic District Commission, reappoint Jackie Hilt and Linda Wood. Housing Code Board of Appeals, reappoint Kirk Kohlberg and Randy Mackey. Housing Commission, reappoint Maxine Lanier. Appoint Kimmy George. 
Income Tax Board of Review, reappoint Donna Bonnet, appoint Demario Phillips. Local Development Finance Authority, reappoint Jeffrey Burr and Rosie Buchanan, appoint Chris Burns. Local Officers Compensation Commission, appoint Andrew Cerner. Planning Commission, reappoint Joe Doyle, Timothy Mahalski, and Bill Larson. Zoning Board of Appeals, appoint William Bowman and Brian Mazade. Staff recommendation to concur with the recommendations of the Community Relations Committee and approve the reappointments and appointments. Commissioners, you have heard the consent agenda <coughs> as presented. Are there any items you wish to have removed for further discussion? Commissioner Warren. Item C, please. Item C. <coughs> any else? <coughs> Commissioner Johnson. Seeing no other. I would move that we approve the consent agenda as presented, minus item C. Second. Been moved by Commissioner Johnson, seconded by Commissioner German, to approve the consent agenda as presented, minus item C. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Commissioner Rinsamasibika? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Gowron? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item C, Commissioner Warren. I move to approve the zoning ordinance amendment. Court. It's been moved by Commissioner Warren, seconded by Commissioner Johnson to approve the zoning ordinance amendment. Commissioner Warren. So this has been talked about for a long time and we've deliberated for quite a while, pros, cons. Um, I was hoping, um, Mike, that you would give a brief overview and if you could highlight, um, there was a lot of discussion at our work session on this topic about if there's a difference about how this applies to residential projects versus commercial projects um, and what that oversight might look like from um, the MDEQ. So if you could just kind of give an overview about that, please. Sure, so what we're anticipating is we'll um, work with a private firm that we'll use as a consultant to review these. Um, one of the aspects would be for the commercial part, which would be uh, mostly on the beach that the city owned property. So uh, we would put uh, kind of down a retainer down with them. So anytime we wanted to do some work on the beach, uh, they would do the reviews for us and we would pay them directly to do that type of enforcement. Uh, and then for the residential portion, um, we would charge a small administrative fee uh, to receive an application um, from the general public, from a private citizen. And then we would route that to uh, our private consultants and they would start working together and there would be a fee that the uh, private property owner would pay to the consultant for the review. Uh, and we do anticipate that uh, it would be expedited and it will come in uh, cheaper cost uh, than it would be for the DEQ to do the review. And so all of these projects, all of this approval process with a consulting company mm -hmm. would be sent to the DEQ or it would just be on file in case the DEQ essentially audited or wanted to look at them? Yes, for the most part it would be kept on file uh, in case the DEQ wanted to audit us. Uh, however, in the case of a special use project, that does have to be forwarded to the, the DEQ. Okay. Another question. Um, when we were presented with this at the work session. There was talk about um, a consulting company that is used frequently in the state and has a lot of experience. Um, if I remember correctly, it was it was mainly one that that did this a lot. Is that yeah true? Prism Science and Technology out of um, the St. Jo Joseph area. Mm -hmm. They do about eighty percent of the uh, private consulting uh, around the state. So my only question with that is, would we be worried then if they said tomorrow, eh, this isn't, this isn't for us anymore, we're, we're out, we don't exist, would we kind of be scrambling? Uh, they've emailed me twice since September saying that they're still very interested in, in working with us. So okay. um, I anticipate that that would be the case here coming up over the next couple of months as well. And would we put this out to bid? Uh, I'd probably like to put it out to bid just to see if anybody else uh, can compete. Okay. I, I don't anticipate that anyone's going to be have the experience or uh, the good thing about them is that they're so close. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 
it wouldn't be hard for them to come up here mm -hmm. uh, if there's an emergency. You know, we find that out a lot. Um, enforcing, helping the DEQ enforce. Um, we caught a couple of projects starting without permits. Um, so we had to warn the DEQ about it. Uh, their response time from Lansing and a limited staff to uh, work on the whole state uh, can can cause delays. So having someone you know about an hour and a half, two hours away would be great to come up here uh, for any type of infractions to help us out with that. Mm -hmm. Right, so that would be in our control yes. to enforce those. Yep. Okay, Commissioner German, you had a question? Yeah, yeah, Mayor. Um, so this whole item is basically talking about a zoning ordinance. Now, um, if approved, that gives a, what, a gateway to start our possible development in that region, or, or what are we looking at uh, forecasting? Uh, it, it shouldn't really change, uh, you know, what can and can't be developed. It's just who's going to be doing the review. Right mm -hmm. now, uh, most municipalities just have the DEQ review of the properties. Uh, anytime, you know, if a house is being built, steps are being built, or, you know, a driveway is being put in, anything minor like that, all the way up to, you know, a big commercial development. Those would all have to go through the state, unless the city enacts their own ordinance and chooses to enforce it themselves. Um, the way the law was written, I think, you know, in 1989, most people didn't really know what they were getting into, and they said, well, the state's going to take care of it, so we're just going to let them do it. Um, over the years, a few municipalities have noticed that they could probably do better enforcing it on their own. Um, and that's kind of what we've decided over the past couple years looking into this. So um, it's not going to change the critical dune areas. Those are, it's going to stay the same on the map. It's not going to change the process at all for somebody having to do uh, get a permit and doing it. Uh, it's just going to be under our control now, and we feel like we can expedite the process. Okay, and if I understand you correctly, you said the critical doom map. So there's not going to be any projects or anything removing any sand or anything on those dunes or anything for potential future projects or anything like that? Well, you know, we don't know what a potential project could be in the future, mm -hmm. but if they want to propose something, we have to make sure it meets the ordinance. Right. And our ordinance is going to be basically identical to the state's ordinance. So it's not going to give a developer any leeway to, okay, to remove more sand than they would uh, normally. OK. All right, thank you, Mike. OK. Commissioner Warren? Um, thanks for all your time and extra answers. The, there's a big concern that we are um, adopting something that continues to protect our critical dunes. Um, and so with the diligence of this and and explaining that, it helps put um, many at ease that we will be working yeah, diligently to protect I, I understand people's concerns. Um, and, you know, I, I personally think it's going to give us more control and extra protection because the state's not going to leave us alone. They're going to be looking over our shoulders. So we're mm -hmm. going to have them, you know, peeking in on us. We're going to have a, a private consultant who has a great reputation for upholding these um, ordinances, um, and we're going to have us out there as well. Um, so I think that's been shared with some of the uh, citizens, and uh, Larry Page was here in December, mm -hmm. had some good things to say, and that was uh, very reassuring that we have the public's trust now as well. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Commissioners? Roll call, please. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Garwin? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Runsima Savinka? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Is there any other business to bring before the board this evening? Commissioner German? Yes. A uh, couple of things. Uh, now that we've gotten snow for uh, this year, uh, just wanted to bring something to uh, that was mentioned to me by one of the constituents. And it's not really a whole lot that we can do about the snow, um, but I had a couple of complaints, for, you know, and concerns with citizens about the DBW or the um, trucks plowing snow, kicking it back up in the driveways and sidewalks of residents. And um, I basically said that that was just little that we could do, you know, due to the, um, you know, high volume of snow um, that's been falling, but I said I would mention it, you know, and we do our best to try to, you know, maintain and keep the snows 
off the street. So, just and another thing, um, last year I had um, our Chief Lewis um, address this matter on New Year's. Um, there was a lot of gunfire, you know, people celebrating the New Year's. And if um, I don't think he's in the He's not here today, is he? Yeah, uh, you know, I would would have wanted him to kind of speak on that and just to enlighten the public on, you know, the law and the ordinance on what they could do and what they can't do, and you the uh, repercussions <laughs> behind doing that, you know. So you can't fire your firearm. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> exactly, you know. And he stated that last year, but you know, some citizens, you know, were firing gunshots at 10 o'clock, you know, before p.m you know, two hours before the New Year, so <clears throat> just a warning. You can fire fireworks, though. Yeah. Yes, fireworks. Right. Fireworks. 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 <laughs> Not firearms, fireworks. Yeah. 24 hours on either side of a holiday. And not after one? Yeah. They, 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 one a.m.? Yeah. And even better yet, don't do it at all. <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. Uh, just to touch base about the, the snow issue as well. We talked about it, I brought it up last night in the work mm -hmm. session about um, the parking ban, overnight parking ban, um, and what to do for those residents that um, may not have a driveway or a terrace, um, because during the parking ban you can park on your terrace, um, but some residents don't, and they may be getting ticket, ticketed and have no place to park. Um, and when we put that ordinance into effect, um, you know, our understanding and what Chief Lewis had communicated was that we're going to exercise common sense discretion in terms of enforcing that. If um, there is truly no place for them to park, allowing them to park in the front yard or side yard, um, or trying to find another area in, in the immediate vicinity of the neighborhood to park. And um, I just wanted to share that here for people here and also at home um, on television um, that they can contact Captain Andy Rush um, or Chief Lewis's office uh, with um, his administrative assistant there, Liz Parker, um, and they will help those residents that um, uh, may not have any place to park um, during that parking ban window of uh, December 15th through the end of February. So I just wanted to reiterate what we learned last night and what we, what we uh, heard from Chief Lewis last night um, in our work session. So okay. thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Anything else, commissioners? At this time, then, if there's any members of the public that would like to uh, address the commission, uh, each individual is allowed three minutes uh, to make uh, any statement. And uh, if you'd like to come forward, if not, we wish you all a happy new year and uh, best wishes. And thank you all for coming out this evening. Vice Mayor. I, mo I move to adjourn. Support. It's been moved by the vice mayor, supported by, what's your last name? Uh, Dan Rins and Ms. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Commissioner Warren, I didn't need any rollos.